Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 56, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And we just want to say a massive welcome if you are one of our new listeners. Yeah, we might have quite a few because we had a John Romero on last week. (laughs) Now, if you haven't heard last week's episode of the Retro Hour yet, uh, we did have the legendary John Romero on the show. Uh, Ravi was actually hanging out in his uh, secret lair in Ireland. And, you know, we've had the show now for over a year. And I'd say that was one of my favourite interviews that we've done today. Oh, yeah. It was great fun. But we've got some awesome interviews coming for you as well. And we're running a competition at the moment. So you can win signed goodies from John Romero. Now, you were there last week. You managed to get a copy of the book Masters of Doom and the Doom Collector's Edition signed by the man himself. Yep. And you can win it if you answer this simple question on the retrohour.com. Now, the question we set last week was, what was the PC platformer developed by John Romero and the id Software team released for MS-DOS in 1990? Out of breath after saying that. Was it A? Jazz Jack Rabbit. B? Cool Spot. Or C? Commander Keen. Now, you've got another week to enter this. We're going to close it at midnight on Friday, the 10th of February. So if you want to get hold of these signed John Romero goodies, head on to our website, theretrohour.com, and leave your details there. Now, if you're one of our new listeners after checking out last week's show, uh, the way this works is every week, Ravi and I kind of recap the big stories that have been making the headlines in the world of retro and tech. And then we hand over the second half of the show to a very special guest. Now, this week, I'd say this guy is one of the most up-and-coming YouTubers at the moment. Yeah, definitely. And he's kind of covering so many detailed things that I'm really enjoying, like, you know, really rare odd systems and lots of kind of British systems and old television stuff like Bad Influence. Yeah, so this guy is called uh, Nostalgia Nerd. If you haven't checked him out on YouTube, I mean, his channel has grown massively in the last 12 months. And, you know, he's a guy from Britain, so we share a lot of the same experiences and stuff, and he's done some really good documentaries recently. You know, I was watching a video he put out um, yesterday, and he was saying that, you know, He did, like, an Amiga documentary recently. And it took him about six days just to edit part one of it, apparently. It's like, he put so much work into these videos. Yeah, yeah, it's like a feature-length movie. (laughs) Massively long. You know, TV shows take less time to produce than some of these kind of documentaries. This does. does. (laughs) And he does stuff like, you know, covers Acorn computers and Amstrads and, you know, Commodore stuff. So, you know, I've watched him since he started and a really big fan of Nostalgia Nerd. So we're going to be catching up with him. Uh, His real name's Pete. He's going to be coming on in the second half of the show. And uh, it's definitely one for anyone that kind of grew up in the 80s and 90s in Britain. There'll be a lot of memories that you will uh, all collectively share. So definitely worth hanging around for that. And of course, the Retro Hour podcast would not be possible each week without our very generous supporters. Now, uh, you can make a little donation to the show anytime you like. Of course, completely optional. All you've got to do is go to the retrohour.com. There is a little PayPal link on there. And then you can join our Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Do you like that? Yeah. <laughs> and today in the Hall of Fame, we have Jason Ingram. I feel like we should have some like you know epic music going on here. <laughs> <or something. laughs> uh, Mark Johnson. Jonathan Harrington. And Taylor Caitlin, who all made very, very, very generous donations to the Retro Hour podcast. And help us keep the show going. Thank you so much for your support, guys. We did actually get a little um, YouTube comment the other day telling us off for something. Oh, what was it? Someone's like, you guys have got the loudest computer mice ever. Oh, God, yeah. Any of this, yeah. Click, click, click. Yeah, we need to so- get silences for our mouse. <laughs> I think it's your side, isn't it? Gives, yeah. a, cl- gives a click. Yeah, definitely you, really. Yeah. Oh, God. He- heavy-handed. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into this week's news stories then. Now, um, of course, it was some very sad news in the week that I've seen all over. You know, it's been all over the mainstream media and stuff as well. That Pac-Man's daddy has died. Yeah, the founder of Namco. Oh, this is uh, Masaya Nakamura who um, he actually founded Namco uh, in 1955. Wow. And, you know, these are the kind of original games companies that, you know, started all of this. So. Yeah, I mean, well, come on, Pac-Man. That's it. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Galago and all of these kind of great games. What was your favourite Namco kind of title? Well, I did, you know, Ridge Racer, obviously, was such an epic game. Mm. And, you know, the, the series as a whole, I mean, you know, Ridge Racer, they haven't done one for, a, you know, Kind of a AAA one for a while now, have they? I think the last one I bought was on the um, Nintendo 3DS, which was very good. But um, you know, I remember playing that, like, you know, the original PlayStation in the arcade back in the day. My local arcade actually had a Ridge, Ridge Racer cabinet, you know, one of the red cars that you got oh, in. Oh, nice. Which, you know, I'd always go on that. My parents would go and watch a movie. I'd just go and, like, the, play on the that. The chicks with the flags, I remember them. <laughs> but my favorite was Time Crisis. Oh, yeah. By awesome far. Yeah. I thought that was amazing. And uh, games like Tekken and Galaxian as well. I mean... These are kind of the legendary companies. Pac-Man 
is still, you know, the best selling arcade game in history. And you cast your mind back to like when Pac Man was an icon. I mean, there's cartoons made about him. Yeah. Cereal you could buy with Pac Man on. It's like, it was probably video games' first cultural icon, really, wasn't it? Well, you know, in 2006, he became president of Bandai Namco. So, mm-hmm. you know, he'd gone from. Pac-Man and the original old school days to become the president of the company and all, probably all these massive modern titles he was looking over as well. He lived to a ripe old age, 91 he lived to. Wow, so yeah. He's seen some stuff. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, the, whole, uh, the whole development of computer games in his lifetime. Well, computers, pretty computers, much. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, definitely, um, you know, what an absolute legend and uh, rest in peace, Masaya Nakamura. So we'll uh, pop a little tribute to him on our uh, show notes at theretrohour.com if you want to read a bit more about, you know, his involvement in his life as well. Some really interesting articles, but it's been all over this week. So Yeah, yeah, I've know. seen it even on The Sun and The Metro. Yeah, so yeah. not that you read The Sun after I'm ready. No, <laughs> only page three. <laughs> That's still going. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. know, I, honestly. I, I, I trust you as a credible source. <laughs> now, uh, Civilization for the Commodore 64. Yeah, this is amazing. I've, I've seen this, and it's, it's not the full version, okay. but it's an 8-bit, kind of demo of Civ, a concept demo. And it looks amazing because they've kind of done it in the Civ 2 style, okay, which was the isometric style. But they've also got AI working in there. So it's, it's, it's like you can have three different AI opponents at one time. And you can build cities in it. You can still do a lot of stuff that you can do with the Civ uh, engine and you could do with the Civ game before. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this guy's saying, warning, just one more turn can ruin your life because it is as addictive as that old Civ. <laughs> now, the screenshots that we're looking at are on um, Indie Retro News. Uh, shout to Neil, great website. And looking at this, I mean, it looks really visually impressive. They've got a lot of detail. I mean, it's obviously, you know, resolution's lower than the original DOS and Amiga versions, but it's you think of when, you know, the first Civilization came out, that was 1991. That was really after the Commodore 64's commercial life. It was kind of coming to an end then anyway. Yeah. The fact that it's finally been ported to that system and it, it looks as good as it does is just mind-blowing, isn't it? It's like the original developers obviously didn't think it could run on the C64. So. No, and it's still got the basics in there. Yeah. You know, it's got like the city founding. It's got the um, kind of special places that you can have like hanging gardens and great library. And, you know, all the tech tree and discoveries. It's really, really amazing. Well, and it also supports uh, mouse control as well, which, you know, is quite rare for Commodore 64 games. So oh, yeah, yeah. I always find that, you know, there was even, you know, trying to play like, Lemmings and stuff on the Commodore 64, which didn't exist. But it's having to use a joystick in place of a mouse is never oh, fun. No, you know? no, no. But this also does have joystick support as well. And mouse support, yeah, or keyboards. So it's just, you know, recently we've kind of covered these quite a lot on the show. Uh, like these games that came out probably a decade after these systems yeah, were designed. D- D-makes, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. it's just nuts because you never thought that was possible. No, no, totally not. And it, it could have been a hit, I reckon, you know, if it had come out because it's still got the strategy and everything. And to be fair, you know, Commodore 64 games were still selling in 1991. Yeah. uh, yeah. yeah. Good that it finally got its port of Civ, though, so uh, we'll put that in our show notes as well if you want to have a look at it. Now, do you remember watching webcams back in the day? Yeah. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you which ones. No, no, I do remember watching them. Jenny Cam? Uh, Jenny Cam, yeah, one of the first live casters. Yeah. And... um, Oh, God, there was there was loads of unusual webcams, weren't there, early on? I used to go around and look at different cities from around the world, traffic cameras, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it was like a black and white VGA camera. Or something, yeah, yeah. It? Every I night, saw something move then on the next frame. Yeah, every five <laughs> seconds it would refresh. I remember actually Radio 1 used to have all these studio webcams and they'd always act really cool. But it was just a still image of someone sat at a desk because yeah. it would always be really slow. It's like this, you know, it's, uh, that's why we don't do a video show. It's two guys talking into a microphone. It's like, you know, yeah. not, it's <laughs> not, not that exciting, exciting to look no. at really, is it? But um, this is pretty cool. I, I spotted this link from a few places uh, during the week. So this is actually um, what they think is the first ever webcam. Yeah, um, I actually mentioned this in my dissertation oh, at, okay. at university. So it is. <laughs> but um, it was a Trojan room coffee machine. Yeah. It was because the guys kept going to the coffee machine and there'd be no coffee in there mm-hmm. and they'd keep getting frustrated. So they built a webcam to relay the kind of image of the coffee pot back to the officers. So, yeah, this was at the uh, University of Cambridge in their computer laboratory. The page, actually, that it ran on still exists. So you can go to um, cl.came.ac.uk slash coffee slash coffee.html. I was about that for a 90s URL. And it actually gives you all the specs there and stuff as well of how this was set up. Now, it started in 1991. 
On an acorn Archimedes as well. Yeah, and an acorn Archimedes. Now you're talking, you know, the World Wide Web was really the speck of that had only been finished around like 12 months before that, hadn't it? Before the web, you know, was in the mainstream or anything like that. And really, like I said, it, it ran over a LAN. But obviously then, you know, people kind of got the, uh, you know, the, the IP address and stuff of it. And in the end, they said one day they logged on and there was like 15,000 people looking at it in like 1994. <laughs> <laughs> Just watching this like coffee machine refresh like every five minutes or whatever it was. Like 60 or 70% of the world's bandwidth <laughs> was dedicated to this one coffee bar. Is anyone going to press a button? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, amazingly, it was started in 1991. This webcam didn't get turned off until August 2001. Yep. So it ran for an entire decade. And actually, there is a page here. Um, you know, the original link, if you click on it, it shows you the last image, which is someone leaning over and pressing the off button. Oh, I thought you were going to say there was a page of coffee pot highlights. <laughs> there <laughs> isn't yet. The years. <laughs> <laughs> they should have done that, though, shouldn't they? Yeah. I'm sure the time is right for a, a coffee pot highlight. But uh, I just thought it was really cool because I remember, you remember when, like, controllable webcams and all that came around? Oh, yeah. The first time you could click on, like, a motorized webcam and move it left and right. And... Well, we used to do a naughty thing, which was uh, you could actually scan ones on Google and yeah. people would have the default user password so you could actually get on people's and then just uh, move around and move around car parks and I never found anything very interesting I'd just like move a can in a camera in San Francisco or something and be like yeah yeah <laughs> oh you do it, it in the corner of an office and like you know you always think you'd see the people look up at it wouldn't you and you'd yeah. like, you'd move the camera have, have you seen the ones on YouTube where there's some guys have managed to send sound through them Yes, I have. Yeah. And, uh, and they're hilarious. like singing into offices and stuff. It's crazy. I've seen the one at school reception and stuff where they're doing it, which is like crazy. But it's, uh, you know, if you play the game Watch Dogs, for example, yeah, control yeah. the cameras and stuff in that, it, yeah. it, you kind of feel like you're doing, it's quite voyeuristic, isn't it? Even though obviously, you know, these kind of webcams were set up to look at, but you always kind of felt a bit like you're kind of spying on people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's what it was like back then, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was, you know, even if it was just a coffee machine. But yeah. <laughs> but everything, I mean, you, you look at YouTube and like Twitch and all that, it all came from this Trojan Room coffee yeah, machine. Yeah, from really, this it? one little coffee pot. Yeah, so it's a lot of history in that website. And it's called The Original Pages Still Up as well. So I'll show that in our show notes if you want to check it out. Now, the Mini Nairs has obviously been making the headlines recently and everyone was moaning that, you know, it only comes with those inbuilt, like, you know, 60 games and you can't put anything else on it. Has that changed? That has changed a lot. You can put the entire NES Classic collection on your machine. It's insane. Uh, we're going to link a video, and it's Hatchy 2.1, which is this kind of, um, I'd guess, modification tool for the NES Mini. Okay. It's actually called the NES Mini Pimp Tool. I like it. <laughs> yeah. And it enables you to load on over 700 plus games on there and it will still run completely fine it will be in the interface that nintendo did anyway so you'll be able to save the points do all of that it doesn't replace anything it just adds the games to the system that is nuts isn't it, it obviously means there is enough storage space on there for a lot more games oh yeah definitely and i think this is this is a massive selling point for it you know people that kind of were thinking oh well i can only get 30 games mm. you know just follow this YouTube tutorial and you've got all of them. It's amazing. I wonder how much is it going to go for on eBay now. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. A big loaded. price increase. Yeah. <laughs> I love the the top comment on YouTube as well. Well, hackers do what Nintendo don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I still haven't got my hands on money. I haven't actually seen one in the what? Actually, no, I tell a lie. I saw one in CEX the other week. They want 150 quid for it. Yeah, yeah. Is that the one I sent a photo of? Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've seen it as well, but it's like... Everybody's been walking past that in Nottingham going, oh. 150 quid, what the... Well, I was in, uh, what was that, the other day? I was in Derby, um, yeah. CXN. They've got a uh, a Super Nintendo in the window, all yellow, looks grotty, not boxed or anything like that. I think they want 95 quid for it. Ooh. God. I've seen it, CX. Oh, actually, you don't pronounce it CX. It's actually sex. Sex? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I got a pre-roll advert for CX over Christmas. And it said, you know, bring your trade your games in at sex. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's how you say it. Oh, wow, okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, they've gotten to retro recently, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, they have, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen a few things, and uh, I was like, I walked by, and they had Majora's Mask, mm -hmm. um, all kind of boxed and sealed, and it was over 100. Yeah. And I was just like, they kind of have been looking on eBay, haven't they? <laughs> and know? then doubling the prices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's cool to see Retro on the high street, but then you kind of worry, you know, is it price driving stuff up even more? You know what I mean? That's it. I don't know who's going to go for it, though, because I think all the people that do buy retro games and stuff, they're savvy. They mm. go online, they find a good deal, unless they're one of these guys who wants to buy a whole collection in one or something. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess they're kind of more going for the, you know, the guy that walks past a shop window 
and he sees a Super Nintendo. He's like, I've not seen one of them for 25 years. You know, oh, I might get one to get yeah, back into yeah. it. It's probably suppose, more that kind of audience, isn't it? That market. Um, who, yeah, but then again, new listeners to the show maybe after that. So yeah. if you have just paid a, you know, 600 quid for a Super Nintendo and CX, then <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Now, obviously, we're based in Nottingham, and uh, there is, you know, we've mentioned this on the show a few times, in Nottingham, there is the UK's only National Video Games Arcade, which, uh, first of its kind, has been through a bit of a turbulent time over the last year or two, though, hasn't it? Yeah, I think um, they've kind of had a little bit of trouble kind of establishing it, because uh, it's really hard, actually, you know, it's a whole four floor building full of computer games and you've got to spend a lot of money on maintaining those computer games you, people are going to pay money to come in and you don't want them to all be broken and mash up and stuff so they've basically been trying to get this model going and now they've got a foundation which is a group of companies throughout nottingham that have been helping them so sumo digital are here and stuff but now sega europe have actually announced that they are patrons wow so they're going to be part of the MVA. I already went in there and there was a giant Sonic, so that's a good start. <laughs> He's already there, is he? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's it the other day. He's quick, isn't he? Well, Sonic is fast. We do that. Yeah, and that's it. Um, but, you know, we've, we've been to the MVA a few times and it's kind of, you know, for, for I imagine the majority of our listeners have probably haven't made the trip to it yet. It's uh, it's an impressive place. It's not just a, you know, walk in, it's not an arcade. They do exhibitions there and... Uh, it's oh, the right education as well. They've got a big bar in there as well. Yeah, where you spend most of your time when you're there. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, they do a lot lot there and like I said it's a city centre location and it costs money to do that and you know they did run out of money about a year ago got saved by this foundation but having someone like Sega on board gives it a lot of credibility I think. Definitely and they've kind of I think it may have helped that they've announced recently that Nottingham is trying to become the retro gaming city of the UK so this may have convinced other companies to go there but we've got quite a nice little quarter going on where we've got a big national video game arcade but we've also got a video game lounge as well. We've got independent cinemas. It's it's kind of kicking off here. Absolutely. And we're in the right place then to do the show, I guess. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Obviously, if you are ever in town and you want to uh, little, you know, little trip out to Nottingham's Gaming Quarter, give us a shout. We'll give you the tour. Yeah. And we've also got some other Sega news, which is pretty, pretty cool. They've put tons of soundtracks for free. This isn't Nintendo. It's Sega. <laughs> They've put it for free on Spotify. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you've got stuff like Jet Set Radio. You know, you've got Virtual Fighter, loads of the Sonic games, Alex Kidd. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, especially with kind of Mega Drive games. And the music was amazing, though. And <laughs> I, I can be that guy that walks around with, like, you know, the, the Sonic 2 soundtrack on my phone and listen to it. Or, yeah, you know, just I'll play it on YouTube, yeah, yeah. I will, you know. Yeah. I'll play it in the car or whatever. But the fact that it's now on an actual mainstream music se- streaming service like that. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's really good. And, uh, you know... There's quite a lot of good stuff on there, actually. I've been searching for, like, Alistair Brimble and Chris Halsbeck and stuff, and there's, there's some great albums on Spotify. It's a really good resource for uh, computer game music, actually. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think music, it's especially with all the stuff that's been going on the last couple of years, with, you know, kind of electronic music and that kind of glitch step kind of stuff coming mm, back, yeah. people want to get a bit more gritty and a bit more raw. And I think, you know, people are kind of respecting the music that was made in the late 80s and early 90s a lot more than they did at the time now. Yeah, and I guess they've got that Sonic 2 tune stuck in their head forever. So it would just be like, oh, I'll go to Spotify, oh, i remember that one. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I reckon keep that trend coming. Let's, let's get more game soundtracks on Spotify, that's awesome. Definitely. Right, guys, thank you so much for checking out episode number 56 of the Retro Hour podcast. Don't forget, if you want to win all of that signed Doom merchandise, have a little look right now at theretrohour.com. Fill in your question. Uh, you've got a week left to do that and also if you'd like to make a donation you can do that there too and uh, if you are new to the show we do come out every single Friday we're available on pretty much every platform that you can get a podcast from aren't we yeah totally Stitcher SoundCloud iTunes everything yeah. and uh, a little teaser for next week Bits yeah if you used to watch that back in the day yeah you're um, going to enjoy next week's show definitely definitely will so make sure you join us for that we'll be out again next Friday your little treat before the weekend <laughs> and right now let's get into this week's interview uh, we're going to get seriously nerdy with the nostalgia nerd <laughs> and we'll see you next week ciao you're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it's time to welcome this week's very special guest I'd say this guy definitely one of the up and coming YouTubers at the moment this guy you know his channel's just exploded in the last year uh, welcome to the show, Peter Lee, otherwise known as the Nostalgia Nerd. Hello, thanks for having me. Would you prefer to be called Peter or Mr. Nerd? Uh, 
<laughs> Mr. Nerd's got quite a nice ring to it. Let's let's go with that. <laughs> well, for people that may not have seen your channel, um, just quickly summarise what your YouTube channel is all about then. Uh, so my channel, originally, I conceived it to be mainly about everything which I had nostalgic to me as a child. I mean, I, I used whenever I see something which I had as a child, whether it's a computer or, or whatever, I naturally get incredibly excited about it. And so I needed to get an outlet to put that excitement into. So the channel was originally to just share anything that I found, flea markets and the like, and just wanted to share with other people to see if they would remember. And it's turned into more of a computer orientated because that was always my big love and recently well, well i've done a few in the past but it's, it's more aimed at the hardware side of things so looking at systems and the companies behind computer systems and their stories and mainly anything around that it's, it's always fascinated me the stories between about the hardware so that's really what i'm concentrating on at the moment It'd be nice to find out a bit about your kind of history with um, computers and games and hardware. And what was your first ever memory of a computer then or gaming? See, my dad uh, used to be a computer programmer. So he brought back a Sinclair Spectrum for me and my brother when I was about four. So we're talking mid ninety uh, mid 1980s. And that's probably the first system I remember. But it's, it's quite a hazy Hazy time being that young. Me and my brother had a well, the Dorling Kindersley books for programming for your spectrum. And we used to sit there and just type in code from that with all the, it used to have like colored sunset patterns on screen and all these simple programmers, but it blew my mind when I was you know, five or four, six. It was also around the same time when the BBC Micro was starting to sort of wangle its way into schools. And they had like a, um, it was like a turtle which drew oh, logo. Yeah, logo. Yeah. Logo. So when I was at infant school, that came into infant school, and um, this turtle was put in the sports hall with massive sheets of paper, and someone was sitting at a computer and just made it draw massive patterns, and it blew my mind. So they're kind of the main first two memories that stand out to me of computing, and they, that, that just captured me, and then ever since, it's just caught my attention really. It's amazing how um, kids kind of get into gaming so easily and also coding, you know, this really complex kind of thing that adults sometimes find hard to understand. Kids just take to it straight away. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I got into that when I was younger. So I was I was programming uh, things through all my youth and I went on and did programming professionally. But recently, it's just, I look back and think how how the hell did I even do that? It's just, I just, you just kind of lose the knowledge as you get older. But as a kid, it seemed pretty much straightforward. Well, I think those old machines as well, you know, the 8 bits, they, they dropped you into basics, so you had no choice, did you really? You had to learn programming to use them. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you, you, you get given a flashing command prompt, don't you? And you're like, well, what, what, what is this? What, what do I do? And you have to actually read the manual and find out exactly what you need to do to make the thing work. It's, uh, it's just, it, yeah, it's completely different now of course, but kids are learning different things, aren't they? My kids can boot up a computer and know exactly what they're doing within seconds. And it's just like, they do things I don't even know, which blows my mind. And uh, no one reads a manual nowadays, do they? They all go don't, on don't YouTube and watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, they're all PDFs, aren't they? And there's no, there's no fun reading a PDF, really. It's just, there's nothing like a solid manual, the, the feel of flicking through it and finding out what to do it's just it's just gone well actually I, I got two well i'd say new computers recently i actually got an acorn um a3010 which i know um i think i mentioned on your channel after watching your video that i, I wanted one yes um got one recently which is really cool and it came with the manual but also i bought a, a new macbook pro as well which um came with like one sheet of paper and i actually thought that the other day you don't get manuals anymore that, uh, yeah that's that's kind of the reason i like doing what i'm doing because it's kind of it's kind of it conserves things in a way as well so all these things which have lost to time it's just trying to bring them back in people's people's minds because yeah manuals are just massively underrated they were amazing I remember the Amiga manuals. You get like um, like schematics and stuff in there for the motherboard and things. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah like what, what are you going to do with that? Like as a kid, you think, wow, this is interesting. I suppose it got you into the technology behind it, didn't it? It got you more interested in it. And nowadays, you just it's all much a, a much higher level, and kids take it for granted. 
And it's that kind of locked off system as well. You know, we don't want you to get inside and play with it. We don't want you to know which trace is going to which chip, you know. That's what I didn't like about Apple when they came around and they were like super locking down all their systems. It's, it's much nicer to get, get behind the workings and get to the metal. That's where the fun is. So what was your first personal machine then, the first computer that you owned? So me and my brother owned the Spectrum between us. Um and we upgraded to a Spectrum Plus 128, which was a marvelous machine. And we had that um, probably up until the 90s. And then I moved on to an array of various machines in a sh- short space of time. So I got a Master System, uh, I think for Christmas 91. And that was swiftly followed by a Commodore 64, uh, which I dabbled with programming in, but a Mega Drive. And then uh, an Atari ST. And then I've had an Atari ST for a couple of months and thought, yeah, this, I'm not quite feeling this. And got an Amiga 600, which was an improvement. R- Ravi's and, nodding with approval. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, th- that was an eye-opener. And then not long after that, uh, I managed to get my, hold, my hands on an IBM PC, which was amazing. And then ever since then, that's kind of what I've stuck with, luckily, because that's what the rest of the world stuck with as well. It is interesting that you went through so many systems in like, you know, probably, well, less than a decade, it sounds like. I mean, back then, I, I was reading the other day, there was over a hundred different types of computer that you could buy in like, you know, those five years of the early 80s. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I had a Spectrum for most for the 80s. And then between 91 and 94 or 95, I went through loads of different computers. And I think that's where my my love for them really started to come out i kind of catched on to some, some systems quite late in their lives so uh, i'd get a lot of them second hand and realize they were essentially going out of date the moment i got them and then <laughs> kind of ask for a more upgraded computer and it wasn't until i got the pc in 95 where really i felt like i had something which was currently in date compared to the rest of the world it's nuts, sir, because every time you got a new machine, you essentially were, like, starting over, weren't you? I mean, now, you know, you can use, like, your webcam and things and your monitor on a new machine, but then often even your monitor wouldn't work. You'd have to get a new one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I I had some crummy little uh, colour TV for ages, and that blew up, and, and then I had to um, get... I got, I got one of those massive wooden panel ones I think my nan gave to me. Oh, nice. Uh, I, I did my room, um, and then that... That gave up, and most of the systems worked with those TVs, but then as soon as you start moving to PCs and stuff, and you have to get everything else that goes with it, and um, l- luckily most of my systems w- were compatible with the same joystick, so they're all DB9 adapters, so I managed to retain most of those, but then when you get to PC, then you have to get all the the PC pinned joysticks, and it's an, it's an expensive hobby. It's, I'm, you know, I'm grateful to my parents for putting up with it, to be honest. Well, you know, you mentioned you were using uh, BBC Micros at school. Um, what kind of stuff? We, you mentioned Logo. I mean, were you, were you kind of encouraged to use computers by your teachers? Yeah. So uh, there was this one day when, um, I, I don't know what happened, but we came into school and they just had this BBC in the hall and this turtle machine. And they said, oh, we're going to try some Logo today. I was like, Okay, logo, give that a go. You know, we'd, we'd been like sticking bog rolls to a piece of paper the day before, and then, <laughs> and then we had logo. And um, yeah, that, that was there for a day or, or maybe two days at the most, and then it went off to a different school. My infant school wasn't particularly well equipped on the computing front. I, I went to Chroma, and they were a bit behind in the, on the school front. And it wasn't until I got to high school that there was actually some an abundance of computers and even then they had a uh, they had bbc micros and we're talking like mid 1990s here mm. and they had, they had like a bbc micro do, uh, domesday machine which was amazing again because that was a machine which allowed you to walk around a city center like uh, google maps does today and that caught my attention again um but between infant and junior school there wasn't much computing going on at all it was uh, it was more at home and influenced by my dad really and me and my brother playing on the spectrum you you mentioned the doomsday project um or domesday it was a recreation of um, a medieval book wasn't it that had uh, been created to register every person in the land in the kingdom of england that was it yeah yeah that's right they had um all these they, they, they tried to 
to capture every town name, didn't they, and every person. And everyone could send in pictures from their respective towns and they digitized them and put them on those massive discs. And I, I can't remember which town it was, but, but they walked around with a camera. Was it Nottingham? Maybe I'm not, or Leicester, some, somewhere like that. And being able to walk around this town in very slow motion, sort of one frame per three seconds, it was just amazing, e even, even at that sort of speed. And it was on laser disc, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, laser disc. Yeah, yeah. Those, yeah, those huge discs which have suffered bit rot massively now. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've just, um, I've just found one on eBay. Actually, there's one popped up on eBay for like three hundred and fifty pounds at the moment, but that's going to go to astronomical prices. I think they've got one at uh, Leicester Retro Computer Museum. They kind of just whip it out occasionally, <laughs> and then you're like, "Oh wow!" <laughs> yeah, there's one at the uh, Centre for Computing History as well which um, I'm hoping to make a few videos on in the future. Well, when I went down there uh, a few months back, I was lucky enough to be allowed up to their, 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 their stock, their back rooms, where they keep all the, uh, the stores of all the equipment boxed up. And there's just, there's just tons of it. Hopefully, I'll go back and uh, make a few videos on what they've got because it's fascinating. It looked like Aladdin's cave in there. It's like, I don't think I'd yeah. ever leave. How did they get you out? Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I think I'd be ushered out. And it was it was definitely past closing time by the time I left. But yeah, I'm, I'm surprised I haven't been back re more recently, to be honest. But it's, it, I, I, th I think when I go back, it upsets me a bit because I look at my collection and think, well, this is quite impressive. And then I go down there and think, my God, I've got <laughs> a lot of work to do. <laughs> Would you say you were more into computers or you were into consoles as well and other kind of gaming systems? I think uh, definitely computers um really caught my attention i mean when, when i got my master system i i missed having a computer so that's why i got a commodore 64 to go alongside it and i always felt you could just do so much more on a computer i mean consoles like the master system were great for playing games but i i just wanted to do more i, I remember seeing um films like alien and i wanted to recreate the the mother uh, computer in computer. So I started writing in basic for the Commodore 64, a version of mother. So you could sit down and talk to it and have a conversation with it. And it, it, it was that sort of thing, which really caught my attention, just trying to just the creativity side of it and trying to bend computers to your will, if you like. You know, during those like your Commodore 64 and your Spectrum days, did you read many of the magazines? Uh, yeah, me and my brother used to get Crash and Sinclair User and all that, mainly for the cover tapes because, you know, this was the time when they had 10 games on a tape for like a couple of quid, which is amazing. Um, and with a Commodore 64, I witnessed pretty much the end days of Commodore formats right. uh, when when Mayhem in Monsterland came yeah. out and the magazine was getting smaller and smaller. It was down to like three sheets of paper by the end of it. Yeah, but I, I used to read them from cover to cover. Well, Commodore format ran till about 95 or something, didn't it? It was quite late. Yeah, it did. Um, it, yeah, I think it was about mid-95, wasn't it? I think I abandoned it in about 94. Um, I think I still had my Commodore 64 along with my Atari ST because I like to hold on to them. And then I decided to abandon Commodore format and then focus on ST format and read that instead. And then that started to disappear. So <laughs> it was kind of always a chasing game to keep up with the current technology. Did you um, have like a, a group of mates that were also into the same kind of systems and did you all swap stuff and... Yes, it was strange. At our school, there seemed to be sort of one person from each year who was kind of into it. And we'd sort of amalgamate in the IT room and talk about it. And it was, it was one occasion we all got accused of trying to put a virus on the school network. <laughs> so I was like, well, I, don't, I don't even know how to do that. But, uh, it was, um, yeah, I, I kind of had one mate who... Um, I was always friends with from infant school and we always used to talk about computers and he was the first one to get an Atari ST when I had a Spectrum and it was actually his Atari ST uh, I bought in the 90s and we'd always I'd go around his house and play Gauntlet 2 and Double Dragon and we'd just spend the whole afternoon just playing these two play uh, two play games and they weren't that great but we were just drawn in massively by them. And when you got an Amiga, it must have been after school X copy parties. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. When I got an Amiga, um, 
there was a couple of people in the school who had one and we used to go around each other's houses and copy things but I don't, I don't really know i don't know if anyone else has this experience where most of my copied games come from i, I seem to have a massive collection of discs of all these dodgy games i had no idea where they came from i just seemed to amass them from somewhere the, with mine it was like a family friend would meet someone in a pub and get a copy <laughs> of like guiana sisters or something and then give it to me it was a really weird way that i collect discs yeah yeah it's it's, it's strange how you came came across them when i got my Atari st actually i had like some sort of moral dilemma and i i got a load of pirated discs with them and i decided to wipe them all because they were all illegal and that, that's a decision which I've regretted ever since because there were some amazing games on those discs. But I, I just thought, oh, I, can't, I can't keep these. The police might come around. That's the, uh, Andy Crane influencing you there. Yeah, <laughs> Andy, Andy Crane talking about police and stuff. Scared me witless. <laughs> well, we've had like, you know, people that have worked on the, the magazines and stuff back in the day on that podcast and they used to write you know piracy is bad articles you know while writing it on a pirated like word processor it's like yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, remember, I remember seeing that i actually read an article when i was doing some research for a video the other day and um they interviewed a police officer about pirating games and he was so blasé about it he was like oh we don't really bother mate we're not we're not too interested <laughs> at the end they had to put like this disclaimer about you shouldn't copy you know software but this, this guy he just didn't care. He was more interested in catching proper criminals, apparently. <laughs> you know, going back to the late 80s and early 90s, obviously the arcade scene was massive then. I mean, were you, were you very involved in that? Did you go to the arcade very much? Yeah, um, I mean, living in Cromer, which is a seaside town in Norfolk, uh, there were many, many arcades. And we used to go down to them and play all the latest machines. Uh, I remember Turtles was great machine used to love that chase hq was probably my favorite uh machine and there was it was robocop and this was the days when sega were big in the arcades and had e swat and final fights those are for me the, the glory days of the arcade in my eyes i always remember the uh, t2 machine uh, terminator 2 machine with the big guns uh, yeah PC side yeah. place yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that. I remember especially when that came out on the Mega Drive because I had the Menacer. And that was quite mind-blowing because they had digitized graphics. Yeah. Which was impressive, especially for the Mega Drive. I always remember we'd do like um, Simpsons Arcade because obviously all the family can play on that when you get, go to the seaside. Yeah. And uh, do you remember, I don't know if anyone else remembers this, it was a thing called um, the Sega um, R360. This kind of weird thing you sat in, it was like a like an afterburner kind of game in there and it would actually spin round and you, it was about three quid to go on it. Oh, did it go upside down? Yeah, it was like kind of a flight sim that, you know, it was like a, a dome thing you sat inside and it just spin round. It was... I, di I didn't I didn't realise we even had them. I thought they were uh, J Japan only. I always wanted to find one. I yeah, there's one in Scarborough. That's where I played. Is there? Yeah, well, the, 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 <laughs> yeah, it was about 25 years ago. Probably sure now. covered I'm in going... vomit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go and check. <laughs> but the, I mean, Sega were really innovative back then, though. I mean, they were really pushing the boundaries in the arcade, yeah, weren't they? Yeah, they, they, they had like a massive arcade in london didn't they their yeah. own place their own carpets and all sorts of things going on but um you, you can still get it, it because obviously norfolk is highly rural and possibly inbred there's machines all over the place in norfolk in these like like holiday homes mm. um so if you go to like uh to be seaside camps i went to one the other day and they always have like a small selection of machines stuffed in the corner and um, most of them aren't working, but you occasionally get like a working Chase HQ cab or something still with the original 10p mechanism. And it's just, I just love doing stuff like that and going and finding these old machines. Well, I notice you like to cover lots of different different types of systems as well. And the Dragon 32 as well, I never see any coverage of that anywhere. And it's a very strange Welsh computer. Could you tell us more about that? <laughs> Yeah, so I think I think the more bizarre and uh, unknown the machine is, the more I find it endearing and want to cover it. So in, in the eighties, I didn't even know about the Dragon Thirty Two at all. It's only recently that I've come across it and unearthed all these these bizarre niche machines and things like the Dragon Thirty Two really appeal to me because because it, it seemed to have quite a big following of its own. And the more you look into it, the more you see. Uh, there's there's like still a massive loyal community of fans about these machines and like the Oric one and 
they had their own sort of personality and that and the games on them they're, they're quite they're quite specific like like the dragon 32's color palette is quite garish which i quite like and it's got a game on it called uh, the phantom which is like an early first person shooter game nice. and you can walk around a maze and you've got to get away from these phantoms a bit like the that dinosaur game on the zx81 but I played it, and it had so much atmosphere that I thought, this is, this is, this is quite impressive. I need to document this machine because it's, it's just, I just find it fascinating, all about it, all about how it was made, everything. So how big is your collection, then? Have you, you, how many machines have you got, roughly? <laughs> well, um, they have been reducing recently. I did, at one point, when the channel was started, I, I, I amassed quite a few machines. I think there's, on my website, there's still a list of all of them. But that's when I decided that I needed to do something with them. And that's when I thought I better make a, a, a YouTube channel just to, just to share these things. But um, recently I've been sort of making videos about the machines and then selling them to make room for new things and to raise some money and then getting a, another machine in. So recently I've just managed to get hold of two Amstrad CPCs to make my Amstrad CPC video. I'm going to film them capture as much footage as I can and then once I finish with them and once the video is done then I'll probably sell them on so that someone else can enjoy them because I don't I don't often go back to them I have my staple machines such as the Atari ST and the Amiga 600 which I I, I dabble with but these more niche machines I don't often get time to fire them up so I don't really want them just sitting around collecting dust I'd rather someone else was playing with them well, no, you did a video on the uh, well, my first machine, the Commodore Plus Four, recently, and it was nice to see someone else. I mean, I, I take it you didn't have much experience with that machine beforehand. Was, no, yeah, <laughs> no, no, nice not to see really. a fresh pair of eyes on it, though. It was interesting. Yeah, I, I need to make a proper uh, system story about that because that's another interesting story. How it's such a bizarre machine, how it how it fitted into Commodore's story, it just seems completely out of place. Um, so I fired it up, and I didn't know much about it, and obviously some of the comments reflected that because. They were pointing out errors I was I made and things I was talking about. Yeah, it's 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 just that sort of bizarreness which really captivates me about why why did these companies think it was a good idea to create a machine which wasn't as good as their main machine at the time? What does um, your other half think about your uh, your collection or obsession then? Well, I mean, it's not, not really bothered at all to be honest. Um, it's 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 more my, my my kids find it a bit um difficult to walk in my bedroom because it's sort of towering with machines so <laughs> they have to kind of be careful that Hands nothing, off. yeah 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 precariously stacked so they kind of stay away from my room but uh, it, it's it's all in the attic and it's mixed up with their toys sometimes i find stuff from from it in their bedrooms i'm like what 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 are you doing this is this is from the 80s you can't touch this uh, but other than that, it kind of just just sits there and doesn't really get touched. Yeah, you so. don't uh, want your kids crushed by a Commodore Pet or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> no, no, exactly. All, all that sort of stuff goes in the attic out of the way, but um, it, it tends to get damp up there. I don't want the machines getting damp, so yeah, but that, that's part part of the reason why I sell stuff on as well, just to just to, just to make sure it stays in operation and that um, things don't dry up on the circuit boards. So, what's the um, oddest system you have then? Uh, it's probably my S Sinclair Z88, which was a machine which Clive Sinclair made in the late 80s, early 90s. It's so a sort of like a handheld uh, organizer, but it's based on a Z80 processor and it can run, it's got basic on it. And there, there's even like a version of Jet Set Willy for it, I believe. But it's just a two, it's a two row screen LCD. Uh, in monochrome it's a it's quite a simple machine but for the time it's it's sort of the era before they started moving to little at notepads like the, the amstrad notepad and apple brought out the touchscreen a few years later their touchscreen notepad thing so it's just an interesting artifact of history and i i, I love clive sinclair and all he's done so it's fascinates me it, it did some very strange stuff when it got towards you know after the mid 80s even like the sinclair ql have you got one of those in your collection yeah, I did. I did have a Sinclair QL. I've done a video on that a while back. Um, that is a bizarre machine. I think a lot of these machines are, are more bizarre because of the lack of software for them. So you get them and you think, well, what, 
what do I do with this? <laughs> just because there's not much you can do. But there are some impressive games with a QL. I, I downloaded a pack because you can still buy uh, them commercially from some bloke on on online. And the games with them, are, it's pretty. It's got some pretty interesting things. They're really colourful, and it's, it wasn't a games machine, but it's just interesting how different things appear on these different machines. That, that fascinates me. Kind of comparing a QL game to a Spectrum game and the differences in how it looks and colours. I just find that incredibly enthralling. I quite like these obscure systems as well. It's kind of like, it's a bit tragic in a way, isn't it? Because you hold these machines in your hand and you think these are, they're kind of failed dreams already, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, someone put their entire life into coming up with this machine, loads of people involved in it, and it just didn't take off. I mean, I, I can't even imagine how how devastated I would be if I designed the machine and it just, it just didn't sell. So which machines are um, on your hit list then? Is there any that you really want, like the, the dream machine that you still need to get? Well, I keep getting requests to do a video on the Sam Coupe, which was kind of an upgraded Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, it came out in the early 90s, but they go for ridiculous money. And there's I also quite like... Um, uh, I can't remember. There's like a li- there's like a little white Sinclair clone as well. I can't remember what it's called. The something jet or something. I can't. Okay. Slips my memory now. But there's so many obscure machines. Um, I, I don't particularly have any any favourites I want to get. I just want to cover them all. And that, that is my intention: is to go through every obscure machine I can lay my hands on and make a video about it. Yeah, it'd be good to do a video on those uh, weird Russian spectrums that came out at one point as well. That yeah, just... yeah, the, the Russians went crazy, didn't they? Making so many different clones. I, even even today, I think a lot of them are using Spectrum clones. It, it's just amazing what they managed to do on these barely upgraded Spectrum machines. I was wondering which YouTubers have influenced you. I kind of started watching YouTube uh, a few years back. I was kind of made redundant from my job. And it's only so long you can sit around in your house in pants before you get bored. So I started uh, looking at YouTubers. And Clint, uh, ba- I can never pronounce his surname. Is it Basinger or Basinger? Ba- Basinger, I think. Yeah. We, 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 we had him on about two months ago. We, yeah. We, we yeah. How, well, how did we say his name, Dad? <laughs> Basinger. I, yeah. I, I listened to your interview with him. Uh, I found it very interesting. But um, yeah, Lazy Game Reviews was a massive influence on me. I, he did, his style just caught on to me straight away. I kind of related him to uh, to myself. And as soon as he started making lots of views and started going doing it full time, I thought, wow, this is interesting. Maybe there's something in this. You know, Maybe I can start making videos as a hobby and see where it leads to. And the other uh, YouTuber who really caught my attention back then was a guy called Dan Wood. Never. Really impressed with his video. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I, I'm always trolling his uh, videos. <laughs> In my <Yeah>. comments. <laughs> no, no, I, I do agree. I think Dan's videos uh, were out there really early. So yeah, that, they, that they really were. helped establish stuff, you know. And there, there wasn't um, there wasn't many other sort of people doing Amiga stuff. Um, but so it really caught my attention. And I, I would say that LGR and Dan have the two main influences of what I do. Uh, there was another bloke called um, Terry Stewart. Have you heard, oh, heard yeah. of him? Yeah. yeah. So I used to kind of watch his videos to, to send me to sleep, but not in a bad <laughs> way. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're quite um, interesting videos, but they just caught my attention. Oh, they're very in-depth, aren't they? Yeah. They're massively yeah. long, those ones, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. And I, I, that's probably... Another reason why I started to get so interested in the hardware side of things. Well, at the moment, you've been doing these kind of long-form documentary-style um, videos. I know your last couple have been about the Amiga story, which, you know, Ravi and I have been into the Amiga all our lives, but these, I'd say, the most in-depth YouTube videos I've ever seen on the Amiga. Um, there must be a lot of work goes into making those videos. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, the first one probably didn't take as long as the second one, but it, it, it they, they generally involve... It takes me about a week to write the script because there's an immense amount of research that goes into it. I, I, I tend to cross compare websites and people just to make sure that the information I've got is as accurate as possible and then write the script. And then the longer it gets, the more I think, my God, this is going to take a long time. But, but, but it normally takes about a week to make the script, a week or two. And then editing the video takes probably another week or two. And this is like sort of five six hours a day 
just working on make, making these videos. And so, so when it's done, it's quite a relief. And if it goes down well, then all the better. But they do take a long time. <laughs> Well, to me, it's the kind of, it's the complete, well, not the complete story of Amiga, but it's the story up to a point of the 90s, uh, the point before it goes all absolutely bonkers, and you probably would take about a year to cover that, all the drama that happened in between. But you yeah, cover it really well, I think. I, I, I did want, I, I considered doing a third part, but that isn't really the area which interests me. The, I'm, I'm more interested in pre, pre-2000s and the actual proper... Amiga and Commodore and then after that I touched on it lightly but as you say there's just it's just so much it's all over the place it's just hard to keep track of and it gets a bit depressing as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it does it, 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 we, we sort of enter the depressing stages of retroism don't we where things get old and it's like nah, I, don't, I don't want to talk about that <laughs> some of your videos I really like are the ones where you um, sit down and you just put bad influence on and uh, kind of do commentary over them yes where, where did that That's... idea come from <laughs> <laughs> that, that's kind of like a a, a wind down because I, I used to watch just bad influence just for for fun. I mean, I went through a whole era, a period a few years ago of just watching the entire series. I mean, I wanted to watch it again. And I thought, well, now I've got a channel rather than just sitting here by myself. I might as well just talk about it as I go through it because it's it, it's, it's I, I tend to make videos that I would have wanted to watch. So. When I, I would have loved to have watched a video where someone was talking about what was going on from the current time. And that's just w- what I do. And it's, it's quite chilling because Bad Influence is about 20 minutes long. So I just put it on, record for 20 minutes, and then that's a video. I kind of quite, find it quite refreshing that you do cover Bad Influence, though, because everyone always talks about Games Master. And I used to watch that as well, but Bad Influence is always my favourite of the two. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um Games Master was nice for a bit of tea time viewing because it was on about six o'clock. So once your mum's made your dinner, you sit down and watch a bit of uh, Games Master. But it, it wasn't for me as engrossing as Bad Influence because Bad Influence used to talk about the hardware and go into details about things on different platforms and software. Whereas Games Master was just purely this bloke playing this bloke in this game and seeing he won, which was good. I, I definitely watched all of them. It's just... Um, yeah, Bad Influence was more interesting, I would say. I think I I really missed out because I never actually saw Bad Influence on TV when it was on. Uh, I was like a Games Master guy in Nightmare. <laughs> but no, <laughs> no Bad Influence, yeah. They're all on YouTube <laughs> you <did>. now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Nightmare, Nightmare was a, a good show. There's so many good shows. Uh, but yeah, Nightmare was interesting because that was all done by computer graphics as well. A- anything. There was also, do you remember a program with Craig Charles in? <laughs> yeah. Where they, battle zone or something wasn't it they had two they had a space one a space commander or cyborg commander and then battle zone which was another one yeah it it was just some people walking around in this virtual reality world not having a clue what was going on (laughs) didn't seem to have any sort of uh storyline or point to it but fascinating nonetheless yeah and craig charles would just be shouting at them (laughs) kind of directing them around (laughs) trying to make a show out of it yeah, yeah, he just like scream, just like he did in um in in robot uh, robot, robot program. He used yeah. to stand at the side and shout. <laughs> well, you know, you've even been going further back on your channel recently, like the you know the original BBC computer shows. You've been covering them as well, haven't you? Yeah, I love that. I don't, I don't know why. I just feel some sort of connection to it. I don't know if I can remember watching them vaguely in my subconscious from infant school, but it's just that early exciting world of a microcomputer and. Those programs just seem so dark. I don't, I don't know why. They just seem so, like, eerie and um, just, 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 a, just a bit dark. Well, the, um, first, the first ever live hack on TV happened on that show. Have you covered that episode yet? No. Um, I think Retro Game of VX I saw yeah. had that on. Um, but no, I, I haven't got to that yet. I like to do things in order, so I'll get to that. Um, a, a while back, I also covered a children's program called the the tall night or something the tall night and that was a children's program that used to be shown to infant schoolers in in the afternoon and that was scary as hell it had some massive night he used to walk around as a ghost in this castle and that that, that really sh- shook me up so i don't know what it is about 80s tv but it's just had this dark edge to it you know what you've got to do next it's got to be tomorrow's world Yes, yes, I have been trying to find some episodes of that. They are hard to track down. 
because they they that, 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 that series has run for so long, hasn't it? And they were weekly, and yeah, yeah. I'd really like to get a hold of the nineteen nineties ones, but it's it's hard to find them. I'll try and have a look around and see if there's any because I yeah. love that show. It's fantastic. You see like clips now and then, but yeah, I've never really seen any full episodes anywhere. No, no. But it's the, the BBC website has some, hmm. which is chosen from the past few decades, but the really obscure ones got me when they would predict something in the future, which obviously would never come to fruition. I just want to get hold of some of those and just see see what they said would happen and how it compared to what actually happened. What's that thing where they always had a phone book and they'd be sitting on thousands of phone books or pieces of paper and they'd be like, all this fits in a CD-ROM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did that on Bad Influence as well. Andy Crane had like a stack of encyclopedias and he was like, yeah, these can all fit on this shiny disc. He showed some graphics of a Mega Drive game and said, look, look these are awesome on the Mega CD, not realising they're exactly the same as the Mega Drive graphics of version of the game. <laughs> well, I saw that episode you did recently. I was watching your uh, your commentary on it, and it's quite an interesting episode because that, that was right at the dawn of CD-ROM, really, because it's got, like, the CDI on there and the CDTV. I mean, do you remember yeah. those machines when they were originally around? Yeah, it's, w- what a time to be alive. I mean, the... Um, that the CD TV was actually st- coming to the end of its life by then. I think that's when Commodore had repackaged it with the keyboard and the mouse, and we're trying to push it again. And I remember seeing them and thinking, oh, "This is amazing! Like, there's there's real people walking around on screen." And then, after a few years, you realised that it's just streaming footage off the disc and then things became quite a bit less impressive i think it's the same story that happened with the mega cd i think everyone had to for a while even like you know when it got to the 3do obviously it was good quality video but every game just had this like and they never hired good actors usually did they it was just the nafas like <laughs> fmv intros just for the sake of putting video in there yeah they were like the worst actors you could possibly ever come across it's 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 even got to it's at the point where you think how do you even find actors who are this bad and (laughs) (laughs) but yeah like on the mega drive the mega cd because it can do 64 colors it's so grainy and although it was impressive as soon as you realize that it's just a press a button at this time game it's just it lost its appeal a little so have you always been into collecting then, or was there a time when you got out of it and kind of rebought your collection, or what happened? Yeah, not really. Uh, so I had all these computers in the 90s, and I used my PC on a hugely regular basis. So up until about 1998, I would say, and then I discovered alcohol. <laughs> and after that point, <laughs> I didn't really touch a computer for a few years, say maybe five years or something. And then... I kind of thought after that, well, yeah, this, this drinking malarkey isn't that fun, really. I kind of miss messing around with computers. And then I started to get back into it in the early, mid-noughties. And then started collecting again, sort of about 2011, and reclaiming my old machines and trying to capture some of my youth. Have you uh, had any experience playing with emulators or doing any of that stuff? Yeah, um, a lot of my videos are done with emulation because it's just a a lot more straightforward. I mean, I'm a big fan of emulation because, you know, for a system, a piece of hardware to be coded up in software is pretty incredible. And they're they're so close to the actual hardware, I'm 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 all for it completely. Well, uh, we're just wondering what videos you've got coming up as well. So I, I don't really plan videos. I mean, the videos I do during the week, they are done sort of off the top of my head on the day depending on what i feel like doing so i think i want to watch an episode of bad influence when i make a video on bad influence but i do have uh i'm currently doing the amstrad cpc system story i put a poll out to my patreons and they decided by a sliver that the amstrad cpc should be next so that's what i'm going to be focusing on but i've just finished the script and that's taken me the past week so i'm going to be editing it out and that's gonna it looks like it's gonna be a multi-parter because it's gone on for a lot longer than i had envisaged and after that i might look at the links i think or possibly the atari 400 or 800 series the amstrad is interesting so at the moment it's you know i see a lot of games getting ported to it like pinball fantasies is on there now isn't it and it seems to be yeah. a system that's getting a lot of attention all of a sudden 
Well, it's such a, it's such, a, it's quite an impressive machine when you look at it. it. It is, in a lot of respects, better than the Commodore sixty four, mm. apart from the sound chip. But it, it's got the speed of the Spectrum and the color palette of this Commodore sixty four, and you can just do some impressive things on it. And especially with the the, the, the Plus hardware, which came out in the nineties, that was so underused. It's only it seems recently that people are starting to get a handle on it. I think there was a an Amstrad CPC competition just at the end of last year, and there's some games came out of that which looked amazing. All right, here's a question that um, might be a bit difficult to answer. I know it would be for me. You're on a desert island. You can have just one machine and one game. What would it be? <laughs> um, probably I would choose a Game Boy, because I'm assuming the desert island probably doesn't have power. <laughs> <laughs> and Tetris with its extensive battery life. So at least I'll be able to play that for a, a good uh, few hours before I decided what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you ate the Game Boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, really appreciate you joining us this week on the show, Mr. Nerd. We thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, it's been great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, if people want to find your channel, then, if they haven't come across it yet, um, where can they find you? Uh, I would personally type in Nostalgia Nerd to any good search engine, Google perhaps, although others are available, and uh, go from there. Excellent. Well, keep up the good work on the channel. Thank you. Thank you.